in building up to understanding who the person of the Holy Spirit is, we're examining the other rational spirits, which include the human spirit, uh, the angelic spirit, and the demonic spirit, and of course then the Holy Spirit. And so we're examining angels, and specifically the question that I want to address may seem like it's kind of like a a theologic or a theological question. I mean, it is a theological question. It may seem like something that's kind of far flung from everyday life, and maybe it is. But I want to try and gain a deeper understanding of exactly what it means to be a rational spirit, um, which is why I'm asking the question: Are angels made in the image of God? And then, based upon that, do angels have souls? And so this is the, it's a little bit of a, a complicated argument, and so I want to start simply just kind of by outlining it. And so, number one, we know that man is made in the image of God. Um, we also know that the person of Christ is the image of God. Now, we know that both man and Christ have a body, and therefore I am arguing that, that the fact that they have a body is instrumental in understanding the image of God. Angels do not have a body, sort of by definition, and so because they don't have a body, therefore they are not made in the image of God. So, man made in the image of God. Um, the classic text, of course, would be Genesis 1.26. I'm not going to read that. I'm going to read James 3, 8 through 9. Uh, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith we curse men, which are made after the similitude of God, which is kind of like a synonym for the word image, made after the likeness of God. Um, and I, uh, I guess I should say what, what my definition exactly of the image of God is. A God is triune, right? Uh, three persons in one essence, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and man is three in one, also body, soul, spirit. But that, that's not some kind of disjointed, like, oh, I have a body. Uh, like, it's, it's completely natural to us, right? It, and, and it is when, when there is some kind of a sickness um, that we recognize that there's some kind of a, a, a disjointing between the um, immaterial and the material natures, right? So, Christ is the image of God, um, I'm just going to read uh, uh, Colossians 1, 12 through 15, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated it, us into the kingdom of his dear Son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And so Christ is the image of God. Uh, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the express brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. And then I, I don't need to read on anymore there. Um, so we see, we, we, we of course know man has a body. I don't think that I need to read a scripture for that. I think that there are plenty of scriptures um, for that. Uh, um, Paul prays in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, may your whole body, soul, and spirit be blameless, preserved blameless in the day of the Lord, be sanctified. Okay, um, so a, a body is critical. Colossians 2, 9, Paul writes, for in him, Christ, dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Um, God chooses, I mean, God presumably can reveal himself any way that he wants to. He chooses to reveal himself in the likeness of a man, right? So God is not made after our image. We are made after his image, right? Does God have to reveal himself in that way? Of course, he could reveal himself 
as a rock, I guess. He could reveal himself any way, a cloud, a glory cloud. Like he could reveal himself any way that he wants to, but he, he seems to multiple, multiple times in scripture reveal himself as a man. And we're not talking about who we know in the New Testament as Jesus explicitly. Ezekiel 126, and above the firmament that was over their heads was a likeness of a throne and as the appearance of a sapphire stone and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it. And this scripture must have been scandalous in its day because Jews would have said God is holy, holy, holy. And, and God is utterly transcendent above man. And so the idea that God is, is any way, shape, or form like a man is just like like scandalous. Like it's like a blasphemy. Remember the, um, the Jews said that whenever Jesus said, I, I am the son of man, or you shall see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven and sitting at the right hand of the power, right? I'm paraphrasing, of course. Um, they called it blasphemy that if you, a mere man, claim to be God. Um, of course, no human as we are familiar with them is God, but Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead godly, of the Godhead bodily. I just really screwed that one up. Okay. Um, and then here's an inter another interesting example. Why does why does God have to reveal himself in this way? Again, obviously he could reveal himself anyway. Once to Exodus 33, 17 through 23. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And incidentally, there is a, a portion in the book where I talk about glory and I talk about he, he is the Holy Spirit, is the glory of God, okay? Jesus, the spirit of glory. Um, verse 19, Exodus 33, 19. And he said, I will make my goodness pass before thee and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy upon whom I will show mercy. And he said, thou canst not see my face for thou shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Right? And so some somebody is going to say, Well, God is a spirit. I tell a spirit doesn't have a body. But just asking the question, okay, how is it that he in Ezekiel is revealed as a man? Again, he will reveal himself any way he wants to. Why, whenever he's revealing his glory, is he making a seeming to make a distinction of his person? That somehow he can see part of his person, but he can't see another part of his person. You might argue, well, his, his face is spirit, just like his backside is spirit. But why is it that he can't see spirit, but yet he can see spirit? Okay. okay. If God is making a distinction about, and then the hand, right? God, God seems to be making distinctions about his person. Are, are, are we going to say, God, you're wrong. You cannot make distinctions about yourself because you're a spirit, period. Right? I'm not trying to limit God in any way. I'm just sim I'm simply trying to recognize that this is, this is who God is, and it's how he's pleased to reveal himself. And so who, who are we to argue with that, right? And so, so Moses, so that he doesn't die, God places some part of his person, his hand, over him, shields his face, passes by. Moses does not see what God calls his face, but he does see what God calls his backside and his glory. And of course, the Holy Spirit is a spirit of glory, okay? Um... My point in just saying all this is 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 a, a body is is important to the person of God. And we see this over and over again in Scripture. Paul's theology in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and also Romans chapter 12, he uses the body as an illustration of God, where the head is Christ, and one person in, in the church, one person is a hand. Another person is another hand, another person is a leg, another person is another leg, so on and so forth, right? And so um, he, he uses his own person as a, um, an illustration for what the church is. Um, 
We also recall the Old Testament sacrifices, right? Where they, in order, in order for them to secure remission for a particular sin, there had to be a slaughter and an, a body of an animal had to be sacrificed. And of course, uh, the author of Hebrews tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Blood, blood is um, flesh and blood. It's physical. Like it's physical. And God requires blood for forgiveness of sins. Of course, Christ had blood. Without blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. John's doctrine in 1 John chapter 4, saying that anyone who denies that Christ came in a body, a flesh and blood body, is an antichrist. Okay? So literally like a necessary doctrine of the church that... Jesus came in a flesh and blood body because right then the, the blood's real and it's not some theoretical thing, right? It's not an idea. It's real and it has real substance and therefore it has real power. Well, I mean, you know, you can argue with substances, but um, it's real, okay? And in this case, it's physical. It has to be. God requires it to be so, right? Um. And then finally, we we recognize that that um, this this Christ, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, we are we are actually being transformed through the process of sanctification and the renewing of our mind into His image, even though we we're already made in the image of God, but that image was tainted and marred. We are being rehabilitated, reconciled, transformed back into that image again, and the image is the image of Christ. Romans 8, 28 through 29, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, for him, for whom he did know he did also predestinate to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open, open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. We are going through this life, and God is using the circumstances of our life through the power of the Holy Spirit to change us, to reflect the image of Jesus, the person of Jesus, more and more and more. And of course, do I need to say that Jesus has a body? Even to the degree that that after we are raised from the dead in the resurrection, after Judgment Day, we again, all right, we're still made in the image of God, we again will be given a body. At this time, it was called a spiritual body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 through 46. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body, which is welcome welcome to the natural body. Here we are. It is sown in a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. And so we, we, whenever we are raised from the dead, are not going to be disembodied spirits, like angels are. We'll talk about that in a second. But we have a body. And so the, the notion of a body, even in the resurrection, and we are identifying with Christ in the sufferings of this life, but we are also going to identify in Christ in his resurrection, and that includes us having a body and we're also um jesus of course had a had a body right he ate he ate fish with his disciples he he revealed himself 40 days before he was ascended so now we are made in the image of god christ is the image of god we have a body and he has a body a body is critical to understanding theology and it's critical to understanding what the image of God means. This is my argument. Okay. Angels are spirits, right? Uh, Psalm 104.4, this is also quoted by the author of Hebrews, who maketh his angel spirits his ministers of flaming fire. Okay. And then in Luke 24, Jesus tells us spirits, 
don't have bodies, right? Angels don't have bodies. I know this is kind of an obvious thing, but, uh, you know, we're relying upon Scripture and not upon um, conjecture. Trying to. We're trying to, right? Luke 24, 37 through 43. But they were terrified and affright, affrightened, and suppose they had seen the Spirit. Jesus was walking on the water towards them, and he said unto them, Why are you troubled? Why do your thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled flesh, fish and a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before him. And this is Luke 24. This is post-resurrection, right? Pre-ascension, post-resurrection. And so again, Jesus appears in a, a body. And of course, we're told, we were just told in, in 1 Corinthians yeah, First Corinthians 15, that that's a spirit, it's a spiritual body, but nonetheless, it is real and it seems to have a kind of a physical property to it, right? And so again, Jesus continues to have a body. Oh. So us and Jesus who are strongly related to the image of God have bodies. Angels do not have bodies. Therefore, angels are not made in the image of God. This is my argument that I'm trying to make. Um, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil. And deliver them who through the fear of death were all in their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And so we know this. Christ was not some spirit floating around. And again, doctrine of Antichrist. He's not some spirit, uh, just some spirit, but he had a body. He took not on him the nature of angels, spirits, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Again, there cannot be remission of sins without the shedding of blood. Right? And so, then finally, just, just wrapping up this argument to conclude that angels are dualistic, we know that men have souls and spirits. First Samuel 1.15, Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Job 7.11, Therefore I will not refrain my mouth. I speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Uh, Isaiah 26, 9, With my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when the, thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Okay? And so, um, here we have a man making a distinction between his soul and his spirit. We can argue about what that is. God makes the same distinction. Uh, Isaiah 42, 1, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him, not my soul. I have put my spirit upon, and nowhere in Scripture does it ever say I put my soul upon somebody, ever. Right? I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. So God, man has a soul and a spirit. God has a soul and a spirit. And so this is, this is, the argument that I'm making, angels also have a soul. Why did I have to go through all this? Couldn't I just read the cutesy little scripture that says, oh, angels have a soul and a spirit. There isn't a scripture that says that. And so we have to take the long route and go around, um, around the long way because there isn't any other way, okay? And so rational, this is my argument, rational Spirits, angels, demons, humans, and God, they have a soul and a spirit. Why? I don't know. It's just how God made it. Um, recall the 
um, I'm trying to think exactly what video it is. It may be the human spirit, the first video in the human spirit where, where I talk about the, the, the three-in-one nature of man as the image of God. And the, the, the picture of the, um, the relationship between the soul and the spirit. And so this is, this is my point in trying to understand the rational spirits a little bit better is that they have a soul as an integral part of their being. That soul is, in a sense, that soul is their identity. The spirit is the source of power, of gifts, of information, of the spark of life. And the soul is kind of like the package that that contains memories and experiences and personality. Uh, many times the so souls are said to, to display emotion. My soul was sorrowful, so on and so forth, right? And so um, angels are exceedingly like us. Like a lot of times people have a tendency of trying to trying to make a, a big distinction between angels. And there are some big distinctions. But a angels, the easiest way to understand spirits, as I have previously argued, is that they're like us. They have ways of interacting in the world. They have a personality. They have agendas. They have language. They're able to interact with us if they want to or each other. They are persons and they do what persons do. So you th if you think about what you do in your life, you happen to have a body and so you rely heavily upon that body in order to do things. But of course, you also have a, a sense of yourself and of consciousness and of your your inner peace or turmoil, right? Um, in the same way, an angel does uh, does not have a body, but yet nonetheless, it does have a means of of interacting, and it also has a personality and a, and a an awareness of itself and the ability to think and to rationalize and so on and so forth. And so the the point is is that there there are great distinctions between humans and angels. But there are also great commonalities between humans and angels as well.